everyone to Geohug. Uh, so before we kick off today's session, I'd just like to take this time to acknowledge the traditional lands which we're all coming from today. I'm here on the beautiful lands of the Gadigal, of the people of the Aurora Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and future. So I'm so excited to have Carolyn Pairing joining us today. So Carolyn is a principal geologist with BHP's WA Iron Ore Division and the Society of Economic Geologists 2022 Regional Vice President Lecturer. So she's had extensive, uh, an, an extensive career spanning multiple commodities and deposit styles. And today she'll be chatting with us about the South Flank anatomy of a martite girthite, was that right? Yeah. Or system. So it's going to be a great session. I hope you all enjoy it. Please use the chat. We'll open up the floor and have some discussions at the end. And yes, thank you so much, Carolyn, for joining. It's wonderful having you. Well, good morning, everyone. And, and thanks for the introduction, Jess. And, and <laughs> <laughs> bit of ritual humiliation on my part for that. Um, what I'm going to do this morning, I'd like to, to um, talk to you about a, a new mass flux fluid flow model for the genesis of banded iron formation hosted martite girthite deposits. And I'm going to use South Flank, which is BHB's big new um, mining hub, um, to illustrate this, this, uh, this new genetic model. Uh, at this point, I'd also like to recognize my or acknowledge my two co-authors, so Matt Crow and John Hronsky, uh, with whom I, I published a lot of this material in 2020. Now, um, it's always tempting to sort of view a bulk commodity like iron ore as somewhat geologically dull, and that was certainly my, my view when in my previous um, life as a commodity nickel sulfide um, specialist. But what I hope to be able to um, convince you of this morning is that having an ore genetic understanding of these iron ore systems is actually critical from every phase from exploration drill planning th through resource estimation down to um, mine planning and mine scheduling and it can even have an impact on the smelting process. So Western Australia or Australia generally is the world's biggest iron ore producer. So um, we produced something like 900 million tons of iron ore last year. And most of this comes from the Hammersley province of Western Australia. Many of you will have heard of this province, but you may not be aware that there are actually three different, completely different types of iron ore in that, that ge geographically restricted area. Um, the oldest one of these, let me just pick up a pointer. So um, the oldest one of these is the, the, the hypergene martite microplate hematite uh, style of mineralization shown here in the top left. This is Proterozoic in, in age, um, at least uh, 2.1 billion years old. It's the, the premier, the, the highest quality, cleanest, highest grade sort of ore mined in the Pamasi province. Um, and this has been uh, the, 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 the giant deposits of Mount Tom Price and Mount Whaleback have really un underpinned the iron ore industry in WA for the last 50 years. However, the, uh, the resources of, of this style of, of, of premium ore are actually being depleted now. Uh, next in age are the, the Mertite, Martite Girthite deposits, and, and that, that is the topic of, of this particular presentation, and I've got, shown you a nice hands, uh, outcrop example on the, the top right there. Um, these ores are super gene. Um, they're also um, the mineralization is also hosted by the banded iron formation in the bedrock. And the ore formation probably started in the Eocene, although it may have extended through to um, through the Oligocene to Miocene. The, there's quite a lot of work currently being done on the, on the date age dating. And then the third type of mineralization are the channel iron deposits or CID deposits shown here in the bottom left. These are piezolytic fluviatile accumulations um, and they're Oligocene to Miocene in age. Now, as if this wasn't enough complexity, all our different ore styles are actually overprinted by the effects of lateritic weathering. And in the bottom right hand um, photograph, you can see a, a hand specimen of lateritic hard, hard cap. This is a ferruginous jury crust. So it is mined as ore, but the, the grade tends to be slightly lower and more, um, more variable than either of the, any of the, the, the primary ore types. What this does do though is lead to considerable complexity because although there are pure end member um, hypergene and supergene ore systems, in many instances, we've got supergene mineralization, um, overprinting hypergene, a hypergene core, and then the whole, the, the, the near surface material being lateralized. So there's a lot of complexity uh, introduced during this genetic process. 
Um, the resource base in WA is enormous. We have um, well in excess of 50 billion tonnes of iron in resource. In fact, I, I read somewhere recently there's about 48 billion tonnes in reserve alone. And mainly this is MG or martite girthite mineralization. Um, this material is slightly lower grade than the, the hypergene ores that were, were the, the, um, the initial uh, ores that the industry was based on in this, in this, this province. Um, but they're now coming to, the, they're now forming the majority of our resource base going forward. The other important thing that I need to point out is that most of these ores are direct shipping ores. That means there's no beneficiation. Um, all we do is, is crush and screen the material to produce a fines and a lump product. And this is then um, railed to port and then shipped um, around the, the world to our steel making customers. And so it's important that we keep both the chemical and physical properties um, within tolerance for our, for our customers. And this is where all Genesis um, an old genesis understanding comes in and it's absolutely critical because although some of those chemical and, and physical properties are um, inherited from the, the precursor banded iron formation um, a lot of the uh, a lot of changes happen during mineralization and, and it's, so it's very important to understand your, your your mineralizing process now this whole um, this new genetic model really came about through a um, regional scale 3D modeling exercise that we, we embarked on, um, really as a result of BHP's decision to go ahead and develop the South Flank mining hub. So I thought I'd just give you a very brief discovery history of, of South Flank. There's a nice image on the right here, which shows you what the Hammersley province looks like today. It's fairly arid with um, spinifex covered um, valley bottoms, these um, lovely white barked gum trees and the low ranges of, of banded iron formation. And the, the whole area is very, very red, very ferruginous. So South Flank, the mineralization there was actually discovered in the, in the 60, uh, well, the mid to late 60s, early 70s, along with most of our uh, current resources. These deposits are enormous. Um, the, the super gene ones outcrop, so they were very readily mapped um, in, the, in the early days. So the discovery phase involved surface mapping, a bit of aeromagnetic surveying and, and a limited amount of drilling that, that proved up, um, that proved there was indeed bedrock mineralization. Then there was a big hiatus between 1972 and 2008. Um, as you can see, we don't really have an exploration problem. It's more a resource definition problem. So a lot of these, these um, deposits are, are, are waiting in the wings until we're ready to, to start um, defining resource and extracting. So the resource definition phase took place between about 2008 and 2017 and involved further mapping, aeromagnetic and gravi gravity gradiometer surveying, and of course a progressive drill out from about a um, 1,200 meter by 50 meter drill fence to a 50 by 50 um, drill fence drill out in order to prove up a, a, a JORC compliant resource. And then finally, the development phase between 2018 and 2022. So um, in June 2018, the BHP um, board gave approval for the Frank South Flank project to go ahead. And in May 2021, the first ore was produced. So where are we? This is the Hammersley province. So here's Western Australia, Perth, where I'm speaking to you from. And this box here is the um, the Hammersley province of, of Western Australia. Uh, the Pilbara Craton shown here in pink, um, the largely mafic volcanic rocks of the Fortis group, group shown in, 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 in green and then overlying that in brown is the Hammersley group. Um, and this is a um, Arch Archean um, to Paleoproterozoic uh, sequence of rocks. It's um, about two and a half kilometers thick. There are major iron formations, three major iron formations, the Maramamba iron formation at the base, the Brockman iron formation, which comprises the Joffre and Dales Gorge members um, in, the, in the middle, and the Bulgida iron formation um, at the top. Most of our iron ore resources are in either the Brockman or the Maramamba iron formation. And um, these lower two iron formations are separated by the Whitman formation, which is largely comprises um, Dolomitic and um, dolomitic sediments and some cherts and banded iron formations and shales. Um, and the upper two iron formations are separated by a, a combination of mafic and, and felsic um, rocks, uh, again, some banded iron formations, but it's generally recognized that this is a, a bimodal large igneous province. And then 
looking at more detail at the Maramambara information, this is the host of the, the south flank ores. Um, sorry, I'm just moving that. Um, the the, the Maramamba uh, iron formation is broken down into three, three members. The Mount Newman, which is the, the upper member, hosts most of the mineralization and is further subdivided into these units N1, N2, and N3. Some of our mineralization also comes from the lowest um, member of the overlying Whitnoom formation, which is the West Angeles formation, particularly this WA1 um, subunit that contains quite a lot of banded iron formation and generally form, forms part of the ore body. Looking now at the camp scale geology of South Flank itself, um, this is the area that many of you may be familiar with as, as mining area C. So the first deposits that were developed in this area, the A, A, B, imaginatively named A, B, C, D, E, F deposit. This is the, the, the mining area C um, operation basically. And we're also mining in the pack saddle range to the north. Um, south Flank, as the name suggests, occurs to the south. This whole area in the center here is, is, a, is, a, is a doubly plunging dome formed of um, Maramamba iron formation. So that's the, these pale blue colors and the um, olive green here is the Mount Newman member, which is the, the main host to the, the, the mineralization. Um, these bright um, red pink colors here to the north and to the south, that's the, the Brockman um, iron formation. These, uh, the Brockman Iron Formation tends to, 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 to stand proud as a, as, a, as, a, as a range of hills in the north, in the Pack Saddle Range area, and as a, some, some um, synclinal cores here to the south in the, the Governor Range. Um, and in between the, the Brockman and the Maramamba Iron Formation, we have these, these flat um, valley areas full of um, a variety of Phanerozoic detrital sediments that actually overlie the Whitnoom um, dolomitic um, formation. There's, a, there's been a lot of karstic erosion of that dolomite um, and the uh, resulting valleys have been infilled with a variety of sediments ranging in age from late Cretaceous to, to, um, to modern day sediments. Um, that's probably all I need to point out here. The, the, the black lines here um, are these mesoscale folds, which I'll come up to talk about in the next slide. Um, they are very, very critical to um, localizing uh, the, the, uh, the best quality parts of the ore body. So let's look a bit more closely at the structural setting. Um, this diagram on the right here is an iron bedrock iron meters um, map. This is a, a way of collapsing 3D information into, into two dimensions. So the, the hotter colors indicate thicker and, and, and more iron rich in intercepts. Um, and the cooler colors indicate thinner and, and, and less iron rich areas. And you can see um, how the, the mineralization is, is closely associated with these, these synclinal structures, which are shown as black, black lines here. And you can see the, the vast extents of the, of the mineralization as well. So um, it's, it's about 20 kilometers of strike length from west to east across the Wheelie Wally Dome, which is this, this uh, doubly plunging anticline. Um, and as you can see, there are, there are multiple um, mesoscale folds superimposed on top of that dome, which, in, which host mineralization. The little cartoon on the left here indicates the, the, the uh, in, a, in a very sort of basic uh, fashion, the, the structural evolution of the area. So the first generation of folding are these, these mesoscale north verging asymmetric folds. Um, there's been a bit of thrust thickening um, uh, on the, the steep limbs, um, and this is, has, has increased the thickness and the, the fracture permeability of the, the, uh, the short um, north facing limbs of these folds. And then um, a second uh, generation of folding um, has, has, has taken place, refolded these early folds about the Wheelie Wally anticline. So we have south flank in the southern, on the southern um, flank of the Wheelie Wally anticline and north flank on the northern um, flank of the anticline. Now, as I said, we, 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 this whole area has been drilled out to 50 by 50 meters. So we, we really have a very good idea of the, the extents of what is a, is a major super gene martite gerthite system, both on the north and the south flanks of the Wheelie Wally anticline. And um, with the advent of you know, desktop 3D modeling, of course, we can, we can look at the mineralization and the stratigraphy in three dimensions. 
And this tells us, you know, you can see, um, you can interrogate the, the deposit morphology, the structural um, architecture. This tells us a lot about what is controlling the, the formation of these ore bodies. In particular, it can tell, it tell us about, what it, about the physical controls on the, the, the flow of the ore fluid. And there are really um, a few points that I wanted to, to illustrate with these cross sections. So this top one here, south to the left, north to the right, we're looking to the west. This is the south flank itself. Um, if you look at this area to the, to the south here, you can see a nice thick um, body of mineralization shown by this, this red um, translucent layer. Near surface where the bedding dips at about 45 degrees, the, um, the entire, um, almost the entire Mount Newman member is, is mineralized. But as the dip declines or decreases with, with depth to, to sort of, you know, sub-horizontal almost, the mineralization, um, the thickness of the mineralization um, drops off dramatically. And although you do, con you do continue to find um, ore grade intercepts a considerable distance down dip, they are so thin as to be uneconomic. So dip is a very important control on the development of economic thicknesses of mineralization. If you contrast this southern um, part of the cross section with the northern one, here we have a nice consistent 45 degree dip of the stratigraphy and you can see that that thick um, body of mineralization extends to considerable depths. Until there's a little parasitic fold developed, you get a dip reversal and within about 75 meters down, down dip, the, the, the mineralization starts to bifurcate and then peters out. So again, that's suggesting that, that, that dip is very important and that a lot of the permeability is, is, is stratigraphically controlled. These are highly, highly banded rocks on all scales from tens of meters down to sub millimeters. So it's very strongly indicative of, of, of um, bedding parallel fluid flow and as you might expect, gravity is the main driver. So when you have dip reversals or very shallow dips, you haven't got um, the drive that you need to get those, get those fluids permeating to depth. Um, another thing you can see from this cross section is the role that, 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 that aquitards have. So there's a couple of, of these flat line thrusts that, that are developed on the, the, the steep limb of the mesoscale um, fold structure. This one in particular here, it's thrusting banded iron formation, Mount Newman member, over the top of shaley West Angeles material. And the shales of the West Angel Angeles um, member act as aquitards uh, or even aquaclues. And as you can see, the mineralization comes nicely down, nice thick body of mineralization in the Mount Newman until it hits this thrust plane and basically the ore system terminates there. Um, of course, you know, it's important to realize that the, these are three-dimensional systems. So um, you have to consider on occasion, you might find mineralization apparently looking orphaned in a, in a synclinal position like this, but you've always got to consider the third dimension is that mineralization connected to surface down the plunge of the fold, of the fold, fold hinge, for example. And that happens in, in quite a lot of cases. A um, couple of cross sections here. These are on the northern, in fact, the northern side of the anticline at the, the, the mining area C. Um, Sex sequence of deposits. Here again, you can see the effect of the thrust, which is bringing Mount Newman member, mineralized Mount Newman member, on top of Shaley West Angeles. And you can see again the effect the thrust plane has, um, and the, the West Angeles member has of being a, an aquitard and basically terminating the, the, the ore system there. But um, somewhat, you know, a few hundred meters to the west, there's a dolerite dike coming through the system here, this provides structural permeability and all fluids are able to permeate down the contact of that dike and actually um, uh, access this, this synclinal keel. And these synclinal keels are generally pretty good um, locations for mineralization because in addition to the, to the, the, the banded iron formation protoor, you've got um, structurally induced um, axial plane of um, jointing, foliation, et cetera. So they're generally very good areas for, for mineralization. So long as you can um, access, uh, you know, a fairly steep fluid path, flow pathway from surface. Um, and basically what this is telling is us is that there are really two types of permeability that we need to consider. The, 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 the principal one is the, the bedding par parallel permeability in the banded iron formation, but we also must take into account structurally generated permeability things like joint sets, um, axial planar foliages, and, and dike contacts. The other thing to note is that this is clearly a top-down system, as you would expect for a supergene system. 
Now, if we look at the, the chemistry, um, we can see that there is also a strong zonation within the deposit. Um, and this indicate, it indicates a strong stratigraphic control on the ore composition. So in, in other words, there's a lot of inheritance from the original banded iron formation composition. Um, and that's one reason why we always quote our, our resources as either Brockman resources or Maranamba resources, because they are somewhat different and consistently different in composition. So in this, uh, again, this is an example from the, from the north um, flank of the Willy Wally anticline. We've got the Maramamba formation here at the bottom over line lane by the West Angeles. The, 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 the banded iron formation precursor generates this really high grade primary ore shown here in pink. So this is the Mount, Mount Newman member, really good quality high grade martite girthite ore. You'll also notice that there's a, a thin rind of, uh, which is colored in, in, in a greeny color here that, that underlies the, ore body, the main ore body and also is present at the down dip extents. This is um, siliceous ore, and what it is it is actually it's, it's it's material that hasn't where the mineralization mineralizing process hasn't gone to completion. So there's still relict quartz um, from the original banded iron formation. It hasn't all been dissolved out or replaced. So um, this is part of the the, the the ore system, but it doesn't off doesn't really it rarely makes grade because of the high silica contents. Um, Overlying that in the, in the West Angeles um, unit, the, the, the West Angeles formation is quite carbonate rich where it's fresh, but when it's uh, um, associated with an MG ore system, near surface, you tend to get, um, you tend to get mineralization, um, but down, but lower grade is quite aluminous. So the, the alumin aluminum content is inherited from the original shales. Down dip of that, that aluminous ore style, you tend to find, um, Man manganiferous and, and iron rich shale. So basically the carbonate component has, has been leached out, suggesting in fact the ore fluids are probably fairly acidic. Um, and it's only as you, as you go further down dip that you find carbonate, uh, fresh carbonate preserved. We do occasionally drill that. Um, but obviously we're trying, we're trying to target our drill holes to, to intersect ore and not waste. So that's, those are the primary, the primary ore zones. And then superimposed upon that, of course, is the effects of laterally weathering, which is everything above this dashed mustard colored line. Um, and even so, you can still see the difference between the, the ore that was originally developed in banded iron formation, shown here in red. This produces high grade lateral ore versus the, 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 the ore that was originally developed over the, the more luminous um, shaley West Angeles formation. And that's shown here in the, in the, the mustard color lateral low grade ore. Um, so yes, yeah, so even though the, 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 the weathering does um, introduce um, a lot more, um, it hydrates the, 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 the ore and you tend to get higher aluminium and silica contents um, in, in that lateralized weathered ore, you can still see the inherited um, original um, stratigraphic controls on, on the composition of the mineralization. So let's look at the fluid flow um, to summary, in summary, the fluid flow in these supergene um, martite girthite systems. The fluid source, these are supergene ores, so the fluid source is meteoric runoff uh, and groundwater recharge. Um, this of course is controlled by the paleotop topography and in this area in particular, that's strongly controlled by bedrock structure and stratigraphy. So the, the banded iron formations tend to outcrop as, 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 as ranges of, of low hills or mountains and the intervening um, uh, Whitman formation tends to form to underlie the valley bottoms. It's also important to realize that subvertical structures can act as zones of focused fluid re recharge. Now, I, I illustrated how the, the, the shallow uh, dipping thrusts can, can terminate an ore system, but vertically oriented structures have, uh, have the opposite effect. They can actually introduce all fluids to, to considerable depths. So they can be, um, they can be a positive a positive feature in, in, in developing good ore intercepts. The fluid pathway, um, this is the, the, the predominant role of bedrock permeability. So the, the stratigraphic permeability is, is, is clearly greatest parallel to bedding, but there is significant stratigraphic permeability introduced, um, sorry, significant structural permeability introduced by subvertical structures. That's, that is a important enhancement on the ore forming process. And finally, the fluid driver, of course, is, is gravity. Um, 
So it has it acts on the fluids um, as they, they percolate down along the bedding plane. That's why bedding plane morphology is so important and dip is important. Um, and the other factor, of course, is the hydrological head or the shape of the water table, which in this case, it, it drops about um, it drops about 100 meters um, from west to east across the, the project area. Um, this diagram here is, is, is basically um, the contoured grayscale surface is the, um, the, the, the shape of the, 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 the Mount Newman Iron Formation bedding plain. So, um, and we're looking at this, it's a super gene system, we're looking at fluid flow along those, those bedding planes. So we can kind of look at it like a topographic surface and introduce the concept of, of watersheds which are these, these pink, pink lines here, which essentially divide up the wheelie wally anticline here, that's the, 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 the core of the anticline, into discrete sort of um, ore forming um, catchments, if you like. Um, and basically we, we, we showed through a, a fairly basic um, back of the envelope type of calculation that is assuming um, making re re realistic assumptions for the amount of erosion and uplift that have occurred um, since the Eocene um, and modeling it um, with respect to these different catchments, we could, um, we could well match the amount of ore, the, the different amounts of ore that were present in these different catch catchments through this, this, um, this uh, dynamic mineralizing um, model. I should also point out that these colored worms here, these are the synclinal keels and they're colored by the, the RL of that keel. So that you can see that these, these fold keels, these mesoscale fold keels are sinuous, not only in a north-south direction, but also in a vertical plane as well. So there are some quite deep, deep um, pockets uh, um, or, or deep um, doubly plunging synclines basically um, here. And there's another case here. And that's important because the plunge of these synclines um, is relatively steep in places. And it tends to make them act like gutters and they, they really focus um, the ore fluid flow. So to summarize the, the mass and, and fluid flux model that, that we'd like to propose, looking at this cartoon on the right here, we have um, basically the, the ore fluid is essentially a meteoric fluid. So you've got a, a rainfall leaching through organic material at surface, producing a low pH reduced surface fluid. Um, this is the BIF proto ore that's being um, attacked by this, this slightly acidic meteoric fluid um, in the Vado zone here shown in blue. This is where iron is leached out of the BIF proto ore, leaving a friable and, and silicious residue. We do have a couple of places where we think we've, we've got this sort of material still preserved, but there's been considerable erosion, of course, since the, the Eocene, um, the Hammersley um, basin basically has been continuously uplifted since 60 million years ago, so there's been considerable erosion um, and there's not much of this material left um, today. Um, at the water table, um, this is where the, the iron-rich sufficient fluids interact with the groundwater. The groundwater is likely to have, to have been slightly, um, uh, slightly alkaline as it is today because of the, the Whitman dolomite and the prevalence of carbonates um, in the nearby environment. Um, and I'm sure that that chemical interaction um, and probably a redox reaction as well were probably instrumental in, in, in driving the iron uh, mineralizing process. So as the fluid flows um, down the bedding plane, um, the iron is, 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 is captured in, in, in the replacement minerals, the girthite and the hematite. Um, silica is leached out. Um, at the downflow end of the ore deposit, you get um, preserved this, this silicious mineralization, which is, it's not, basically it's, it, the mineralizing process has not gone to completion. You've got a little bit of relic quartz left behind. And then ultimately the ore fluids, um, the spent ore fluids flow out and mix with the, the ambient groundwater and we lose any, any trace of their, their signature. So from, in terms of mass flux, um, we've done Griesen's analysis on, on this definitely, and, and from the petrography, you can see that iron is clearly being added and, and silica removed. The iron source, the primary iron source is, 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 is leaching of BIF in the Vado zone. And so you require continuous uplift and erosion to replenish that, that source region and, and, add, and be able, so you can add um, more iron rich material into that Vado zone, which then is leached and, and propagates the iron system, the, the mineralizing system downwards. 
The secondary source of iron is, is the, um, we believe it's a, it's a non-redox reaction, the conversion of magnetite to hematite. Um, and in the process of, of, of this, this um, conversion, you get the release of iron two plus into the, into the ore fluid. So there's, there's a certain amount of um, secondary iron released into the ore fluid um, within the, the mineralizing um, part of the system. Now, what can petrography tell us? Um, the MG or, sorry, martite gerthite ore forming process appears to be a three stage process. So the first stage is a pseudomorphic replacement. So the, um, the original magnetite in the banded iron formation is replaced by hematite. And we call that sort of pseudomorphic replacement martite. And the, the gang phases, that's iron, uh, a variety of carbonates, um, iron silicates and quartz, they're replaced by ochreous gerthite, this very, very fine grained gerthite, but with beautiful, um, beautiful textural pet preservation. Stage two involves leaching. So this is the stage at which the, the, any remaining gang that hasn't been converted to gerthite is leached out. Um, it's obviously much easier to gerthitize um, carbonate and silicate than quartz. So most of the, the leach material is, is typically the quartz. Um, and then the, there's a third stage of, of um, infill and cementation by a second um, stage of gerthite. So there's variable degrees of, of, of cementation by this, this, this um, younger um, and caught slightly coarser grained variety of gerthite. Um, and then overprinting this, of course, is the, the lateritic weathering. This further cements is that a lot of porosity is introduced during that weathering process, but those pores and voids are also finely um, uh, laminated by uh, coliform vitreous gerthite and hematite, which again also tends to cement uh, the rock further. Just go through these stages in a bit more detail. So stage one, this is the the replacement by this very, very fine grained pseudomorphic gerthite, which we think is probably ochreous gerthite. Um, here you can see lovely carbonate roms that have now been pseudomorphed by gerthite um, and some little um, sprays of um, acicular silicate crystals that have again been um, pseudomorph pseudomorphed by gerthite. And these whiter crystals here, these are the, the martite grains. So that's hematite replacing magnetite. Um, Again, in the center here, again, a much better example of, of, of quite coarse grained um, sprays of what were originally iron silicates, beautifully pseudomorphed by the gerthite. And these whiter crystals, these are the martites. So they're hematite, hematite replaced magnetite grains. And then on the right here, um, in this example, you can just see little, little dark um, polygonal grains. These are preserved church quartz grains, basically. And what the gerthite is doing is coming along grain boundaries and producing this, this quite this delicate, lacy, um, reticulated texture um, as it starts to, to replace the quartz grains from the outside in, inwards. There's also a nice carbonate rom here that's been replaced by gerthite. Um, so this is the, the, the stage one, beautiful textural um, preservation of the original banded iron formation textures. Stage two is the dissolution um, phase where any remaining quartz is dissolved out. This is the image I just showed you where the black material is, is quartz, relic quartz. Very similar to texture to what I'm, what I'm showing here on the right, only in this case, the dark gray areas are void space. Um, it, the, the quartz has been leached out, but you can still see that delicate reticulated um, texture formed by the, the, the very fine grained early gerthite um, you notice the martite grains have also been leached, so they're quite, well, they're very porous as well. Um, overall, this rock basically has a very, very friable texture. And that's important when it comes to considering how our ores handle when they're blasted and trucked and, and, and um, screened. And then finally, the stage three infill with this second generation of gerthite. Um, here on the, on the left, you can see the original uh, magnetite bands, which are now martite. The intervening quartz in this original banded iron formation has been dissolved out during the that stage one, uh, sorry, stage two um, part of the process. But you can see a, a coarser grained, slightly brighter gray um, generation of gerthite being deposited from fluids that are clearly flowing along these bedding planes. Um, 
ultimately the, the bedding planes are, are almost completely filled, infilled and, and cemented. This void space is completely cemented by the stage three pyrethite. Um, this example in the middle here, I think you can just see in the darker gray, the outlines of skeletal outlines of a, of a rhombic carbonate, basically the early pseudomorphic girthite, which is dark gray and very, very fine grained. It looks as though it's replacing a particular zone of the original carbonate grain. You've got this nice skeletal structure. And then the second, the, the second generation of girthite coming through in stage three is growing as druzy um, crystals or orthogonal to that, that original skeletal frame. So clearly two different generations of girthite. And this later stage three girthite, coarser grained and generally re-cementing the rock, making it, 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 it harder again, basically, reducing the porosity and increasing its hardness. Um, so to put this all into, into perspective, I've got a little cartoon here looking at cross section through a very simple um, band of iron formation ore system. Um, how, how are these different ore stages um, distributed in, 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 in three dimension, dimensions? Now, why, is, why am I laboring this petrography? It's really important because these are high grade direct shipping ores and we have to keep both the chemical and the physical properties of our ore within certain tolerances. The um, mineralogy and the texture, which in turn control the hardness of the rock, these are controlled by ore genesis. That's why it's so important to have a, have a good ore genetic understanding of these, these deposits. Um, the different types of girthite, so the, 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 the early stage one pseudomorphic girthite, we think this is ochreous girthite. There's been studies that, that, that indicate there's considerable differences between different types of girthite in terms of their porosity and their composition. So this ochreous girthite tends to be very, very porous. Um, it can have up to 70% uh, nano porosity. Um, this is important from the point of view if you're trying to dewater this material, it may be highly porous, but it's probably not very permeable. So if you, um, if you don't do water far enough in advance or if a cyclone comes through and you know, saturates all your dumps, your, your um, um, reclaiming dumps, then you're likely to have a problem with very claggy ore that's not gonna drain well over a short period. Also, you can find elevated phosphorus in, in these girthitic, um, in the ochreous type of girthite. And phosphorus is one of the, the major deleterious elements that we try to keep out of our high grade ores. Um, the brown girthite, this is the, the, the sort of girthite that, that um, comes in and um, cements the rock during stage three. This type of girthite tends to have the highest iron and the lowest aluminium, silica and phosphorus contents. These are all deleterious elements for the iron ore, for the steel making industry. Um, and the vitreous girthite, this is the, I didn't illustrate that with a, with a photomicrograph, but this is the sort of girthite that's formed in the weathering zone in those, uh, those coliform botryoidal um, cavity linings. Um, this type of girthite tends to have the lowest iron and the highest aluminum and silica contents in it. So it's very important, you know, to understand your ore textures um, and your the, 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 the detailed mineralogy of, of those ores, because there can be quite a lot of variation between different girthite types. And how they distributed in, in three dimension. This is a cross section. This is the paleo water table. Remember the, the modern water table is probably somewhere down here and the modern and surface may be somewhere in here. So we've lost a lot of material since the, the Eocene. But essentially the, the stage one, so that's the, the, the siliceous mineralization with relic quartz is preserved only at the, the, the down dip and the, the lower portions of the ore body, as I showed in that, that um, earlier cross section of the chemical composition. The stage two, this is the, the, the leached um, ore that can be very, very friable. That tends to be preserved just um, up dip of that siliceous mineralization. And then the stage three, this is the, the, latest, the, the latest stage of mineralization, the youngest, um, basically tends to, 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 um, to affect the, the, the shallower ores. So you tend to get that re-cementing and, and, and hardening of the, of the ore in the shallower parts of the ore body. And then of course, the lateralic weathering comes across the top and that also, whilst it introduces Macroscale porosity, it also um, increases the hardness of the rock. So that's something we have to be aware of because it affects the, the, the powder factors for drill and blast um, when, we're, we're, um, when we start to mine a new area. 
So to sum up, so this is a cross section through south flank uh, in the mid Eocene. Um, basically, there were uh, Cretaceous sediments in, in place at that time, detrital sediments shown here in green. You've got the Whitnum formation, the lower part of that, the West Angeles, which is mineralized in places, and the, the Mount, underlying Mount Newman iron formation. Um, in pink here, there's the high grade mineralization formed after the, the, the original Bandicoot iron formation with a thin rind of siliceous uh, ore along the bottom and the down dip extremities. Overlying that in the, the, the more um, luminous shaly West Angeles material, you get the luminous type of mineralization developed. Um, and, and down dip, of course, in, in, it's not all grade, but you get these, these um, iron and manganese rich shales developed after the West Angeles with the dissolution of the carbonate comp component. Um, and down dip, of course, the, the fresh West Angeles is quite carbonate rich. Um, and in this zone here, the blue zone, this is the Bado zone, which is where the, the, the iron is being leached by those ore fluids as they pass down through the organic matter at surface through the Bado zone and into the, the main ore system. Fast forward to the mid Miocene, um, basically the, the climate was, was on a cooling, globally on a cooling and, and, dry, and in West Australia, a drying trend because of the, the movement of the, the, the Australian content, continent to the north separating from Antarctica during, um, during the, the latter part of the Cenozoic. Um, at this stage, we have the development of a, um, an intense lateral weathering profile. And even, this is a, you know, it blankets everything near surface, including, so there are later Miocene sediments, these CZD2 sediments, they also have been lateratized. Um, but it does still preserve the, the, the signature of that, that high grain, grade mineralization after the original banded iron formation and lower grade mineralization after the original shady West Angeles. So the conclusion, why, why is it, <coughs> excuse me, that the, uh, the Hammersley province is so well endowed with supergene ores? This is a style of mineralization that's rarely found outside of West Australia, in, certainly not in economic proportions. And we believe it's, it's a, the coincidence in space and time of three factors. So the first of which is, the, is having um, a large volume, a large aerial outcrop extent of iron rich prot protolith. So this is the, the Hammersley province shown here. Um, the, the pale blue is the outcrop of the Brockman iron formation. The pale yellow is the outcrop of the Maranamba iron formation. Um, in orange here, these are the piezolytic CID deposits. So they're much younger. But you can see there's an awful lot of banded iron formation um, outcropping in the Hammersley province. It's probably the largest outcropping area of it in the world. So you've got a lot of iron rich protolith to, to, to start you off with. The second critical factor is the, the regional uplift of what we've called the Hammersley Dome, which is outlined here and coincides pretty much with the, the outcrop area of the, the Hammersley province banded iron formations. Um, we know that from, from, from river uh, profiling, there's a really neat paper by Carol Sonota. Um, we know that this area has been, has been rising um, since about 60, 60, 65 million years ago. Um, we don't know in detail whether it's been a constant, um, constant uplift over the last 60 million years or whether it's been punctuated, but certainly we have lots of evidence of topographic inversion. Um, in this area, we have the highest mountains in WA, in Karajini, Mount Mihari, in this very ancient cratonic um, part of the state. So clearly there's, there's been a, a lot of um, uplift um, and it's probably ongoing to this day. And finally, the third factor, back in the Eocene, um, the climate was warm and seasonally wet. And there was something called the Eocene climatic optimum. Australia was also located much further south than it is today, um, at about 50 degrees south. Um, so the, the climate was, was warm and wet. The, the, the fossil, uh, the, the paleontological data indicate that we were dealing with, with um, probably temperate rainforest um, species in, in the Hammersley at that time. So basically, I'm going to leave you with this lovely uh, image from the, the beautiful Western um, highlands of Tasmania. You can see lovely Nothophagus. These are the southern beach um, woodlands closing, clothing the hillsides. The valley flats are a combination of, 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 of these, these little myriad little lakes um, and peaty button glass grass plains. I want to leave you, leave you with the thought that this is perhaps what the Hammersley province looked like in the Eocene when these deposits were forming. Thank you.